I think that if there is a question, if there is a question which bothers the world, it is the Iranian problem. It is a combination of nuclear aspirations, regional hegemony, maybe even beyond, mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction, and religion, as demonstrated by the Ayatollahs. In order to understand the mindset of the regime, which is the problem, uh, I'll try to show you some uh, of what they say about themselves. Um, just as an opening, I would say that nuclear, nuclear weapons, as for themselves, are not a problem. There are several states in the world which hold nuclear weapons. And they pose no problem to anybody. However, everybody talks about the nuclear program of Iran and maybe some still talks about the nuclear program of North Korea. But Iran actually is in the focus. Not because of the nuclear weapons, as for themselves, but because of the regime. And this is the problem. Because just imagine if there was today a democratic, or even Shah would remain in Iran. I'm not sure that the world would say anything about Another state, in addition to Pakistan, you know, to India, and some other states in the world which might have nuclear weapons or nuclear cap capability, and the world uh, is not so bothered with them. However, what makes Iran different in this issue is the regime. And this is what worries the people, because when people are uh, directed by Allah, who knows what Allah will tell them tomorrow to do with his weapons. And I'm serious. Let me show you how they, or what they think about themselves. Please show this Khomeini. This is a pamphlet which was found in southern Lebanon in 2006 by a soldier who was there and thought about me and they bought me some stuff, important stuff, which he printed, stuff which he found in Southern Lebanon. He happened to be my son. This folder uh, is a biography of Khomeini, the one who established the Iranian revolution. And uh, on one of his yacht sites, they published this folder under the title Sutur Enur, means the lines of light, saying that if you read this folder from the, li from the lines, you will see the light. However, if you look at the graphics of this image, you can see something different, or something additional. A light comes from this blue environment and enlightens his head his eyes, his mouth, his chest, and his hands, saying that the light, which is the divine light, enlightens Khomeini's minds, views, sayings, feelings, and finally deeds. Everything is enlightened by the divine light. He is guided by Allah. Allah keeps him from making any mistake. He is, what they say, ma'asum, means infallible. He is in the madrege of a prophet, in the status of a prophet, according to what they believe. 
And this is where the danger rests. Please show the another one. This is another image which they disseminate. Ya Mahdi, on the right. Oh Mahdi. Mahdi is the Messiah of the Shiites. This man, who is made of light, and this is the source of the divine light in the world, has some kind of discourse with the, the person on the left, which is uh, Khamenei, the, the leader of Iran today. Before it was Khomeini, the former one. Now it's the current one. He is in some kind of discourse with the image in the, on the right, in the Mahdi, who is the divine light in the world. Now this man on the right, he was the 12th descendant of Ali bin Abi Talib, the one who founded the Shia. He disappeared sometime in the, in the 10th century, and he is still alive, and he hides in a cave in Central Asia somewhere. Nobody can see him, nobody sees him. And one day he will come back to enlighten the world and to lead the world and to show the world the divine light of the Shia, then all the infidels will convert to Islam and all the Sunni Muslims will convert to Shi'i Islam. And peace will reign the world ever after. This is, in a nutshell, what they believe and what they publish. They say it either in words or in images. And this is exactly where the danger is. Because if somebody is sure that his path is being enlightened by the divine light, that he cannot make any, any, any mistake, that he is infallible, he is an madrega of a prophet, who are all those infidels, wine drinkers and swine eaters to tell them what to do and what not to do regarding their nuclear capabilities? And tomorrow, when they have the weapons, Allah, who keeps them from any mistake, will tell them what to do with this. How not? It's not considerations of human beings. These are divine considerations. And this is what drives them. This is what motivates them to continue in what Allah enabled them to do means to acquire nuclear weapons. And this is where the problem is. Because if a group of people who are sure that they are in the status of prophets, who have a direct access to the divine light, who cannot make any mistake if they hold to nuclear weapons, who knows what the divine light will tell them to do with this? And this is where the problem is. The world senses it. So the world tries to do some things about Iran. And they don't hide their intentions. In another document which I have, original, uh, Khamenei, this one, says clearly that Iran considers all the space from India to North Africa as their strategic background. All these states are the strategic background of Iran. I don't remember when Egypt or Morocco or Tunisia or other states volunteered to be the Iranian background. Just imagine that I declare that the bank account of Rabbi Goldstein is the background of my bank account and I'll start disseminating checks all over the place. Go to Rabbi Goldstein for your, for your money. Okay? But it doesn't prevent him to say that all the region, the Middle East actually, is their background or strategic background. So they don't hide even their intentions to be hegemons of the area. Please show the map. You can see Iran in blue. Iran already controls Iraq in green to the left to a degree that, uh, I'll just give you two examples. Um, Iran sent 
some hundred snipers to Syria to shoot at those who demonstrate against Assad. Some of them, of those snipers, were caught. And the rebels in Syria put them in front of um, cameras to tell in Persian what they came for and what they did. And, this, and they disseminated this uh, video in YouTube, and it created a very big embarrassment for the Iranians that their snipers were caught and they are speaking in Persian, telling everybody what they were sent to do. So they pulled them all out, and they forced the Iraqi government to send another group of snipers to kill the Syrians in the streets, because if those snipers, the Iraqi, will be caught, at least they speak Arabic. And they will speak Arabic to the media, not Persian. Okay? So this is a little sign of control, which Iran controls Iraq to a degree that they can force them to send snipers to Syria. Another thing is that Assad is paying the salaries of his soldiers and his killers and the Shabiha and all those militias who killed the Syrians en masse. Uh, Iraq is paying their salaries. Means every month they send some trucks with, loaded with dollars, cash dollars, and uh, they don't do it voluntarily because the Iranians force them to do this. So I think these are two uh, uh, examples of how Iran today controls Iraq. Just imagine, uh, eight years ago, the world, nine years ago, came to Iraq to rescue the Iraqis from, this, from the dictator, from Saddam. Now they have the uh, Iranians to control their lives after America and other states poured so much blood and money on Iraq, the outcome is another, or the front yard of Iran. Today, Iraq is controlled by Iran. Uh, Iran has clear aspirations to take the Gulf. It means Kuwait, Qatar, the pink one, and the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and so forth. They don't hide it. And already, the Kuwaiti parliament, some months ago, had a discussion whether to join Iran peacefully or not. Means, if you cannot beat them, join them. Because the, Ira the, the, the Kuwaitis have very severe doubts. If Iran takes them, if the world will come to rescue them again after the world did it, in 1991, after Iraq occupied Kuwait. Today, the Kuwaitis, when they see the leadership of the world in the White House, when they see Europe with all the economic problems, they are at all not sure that the West will come again to rescue Kuwait, this time from Iran. So instead of uh, being devoured by Iran, and they have very bad memories from the Iraqi occupation of 1991, uh, they would voluntarily join Iran and let the world jump in the lake, according to the Kuwaitis. Uh, many in Qatar, in the United Arab Emirates, already are shivering of fear because they will be taken by Iran. Saudi Arabia the same, and Saudi Arabia is much more attractive because Saudi Arabia is the two holy shrines, two holy places for Islam, Mecca and Medina. And if the Shiites, are, the Iranians, are taking uh, Saudi Arabia, they will close a circle of 1,400 years since the caliphate was taken from Ali bin Abi Talib, the founder of the Shia, and was, was taken by the Sunnis, or by those who founded the Sunnah. So the, definitely, the Gulf is a very, very attractive target for the Iranians. Another good target is Afghanistan on the east. Afghanistan today is well known as a place where very many minerals are waiting to be taken out from its soil. Billions of dollars are waiting to be taken out of minerals. The Iranians are waiting for the foreign forces, Americans and others, to withdraw from Afghanistan to take Afghanistan almost immediately. They will take it and take advantage of all the minerals. Why not? And they know how to do it without any NGOs of human rights, without any media, and without any Supreme Court. 
they will do the job as they know how to take places and to hush down every demonstration which might be there. So definitely, the neighbors of Iran are the first target. Israel is also there, the small Satan, which they hate, which they don't like, which they would like to wipe from the map, as they say once and again, and we Jews cannot ignore these threats, because once we ignored it, and look what happened. I Iran, nuclear Iran especially, will paralyze the world. Just like what happened with Pakistan and India. Three years ago, there was a big terrorist attack on Mumbai. You remember some Jews were killed in the Chabad house of Mumbai? Uh, and the Indians have all the evidence that Pakistan was behind it. Why didn't they retaliate? Why didn't they do anything about this? Only because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. So India thinks twice before it tries to mess with Pakistan. Why didn't the world do anything with the dictatorship of North Korea? Again, because everybody is afraid that they have something which might be devastating, either for Southern Korea or for Japan or for others. Conclusion which the Iranians draw is that the minute a state has a nuclear weapon, nobody touches it. So it can do whatever they like whenever they like. So for them, nuclear weapon is actually to immune themselves from any retaliation from any other state if they take the Gulf, if they take Iraq, if they continue in Afghanistan, actually they can spread their hegemony all, all over the, this area, including Israel. Nobody will dare touch Iran if they only have a nuclear weapon. If they succeed to do this in the Gulf, they will put their hands on 56% of the world reserves of oil. 56%. They will control the world economy. Really, unlike the Jews who say that they are controlling the, the world, they will do it through the energy. Just imagine what will happen to states like Greece, like, like Spain, like Portugal, if gas, oil, if gas prices um, are going up too fast, only because the Iranians want to topple Europe or to bring Europe to its uh, knees. So definitely they will be, have an ability to manipulate the world the way they like. Israel views Iran as an existential threat because when they will be able, they will do whatever they like in order to wipe Israel off the map while paralyzing the world from doing anything by having nuclear weapons. They have another proof for this. Gaddafi, in the year of 2003, after he saw what happened with, with Saddam, he gave up on his nuclear weapons, or nuclear program actually. Imagine what happened last year when NATO bombed him from the air and caused his collapse. If he had nuclear weapon, nobody would dare to do anything and he would butcher his people until this very day. So again, the Iranians are more than sure that nuclear weapons will enable them to do whatever they like to their region and to other regions. However, they work in phases. Phase one is the Gulf, Iraq and Afghanistan because all these states cannot defend themselves. Israel, according to some rumors, have nuclear capabilities. I have absolutely no, don't know about this because not, not my business, but there is a kind of piece of information which goes from website to website by copy and paste that Israel has something between 200 and 300 nuclear warheads. Again, I, I don't know if Israel has one, but this is what is being just Google 200, 300 nuclear warheads, Israel, you'll find it in numerous uh, websites. And the Iranians know how to read from left to right. So, and Israel, and Israel is not yet an uh, oil producing country. We do have some gas in, under, the, under the sea, yet we have to dig for it. So, 
from the benefit, Israel is way less than the Gulf. And from the danger point of view, Israel is way much more dangerous than any state in the Gulf. This is why, in my view, the Iranians will march on the Gulf first, and Iraq, and maybe Saudi, Saudi Arabia again, as, as well, and Afghanistan in a year, before they do anything about Israel. This is why I, I think I said yesterday, and I say it again, I don't think that Israel will sacrifice itself today or in the foreseeable future in order to save the world from the Iranian problem. Because Iran is the problem of the world before it is anything connected to Israel. Because, and you know what? South Africa as well. Because when oil prices will start marching up because of what happens in the Gulf with Iran, it will affect the oil prices in this country as well. So this is why I think that since Iran is a problem of the world before it is a problem of Israel, Israel will not volunteer to sacrifice itself on this altar. The world says to Israel once and again, don't attack unilaterally. Don't do it unilaterally. I think the whole world hopes that Israel does a dirty job for the world. And this is another reason why Israel will not do it, especially not in the foreseeable future. Of course, uh, Israel might uh, ring the bell here, shout there, in order to wake the world up vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian problem. Yet, I don't see Israel acts. Unilaterally, maybe Israel will be part of a worldwide campaign against Iran if there is some decision like this uh, with other states, maybe. But uh, uh, only by itself, I highly doubt. And again, Netanyahu doesn't consult with me. This is the issue about Iran. I don't see Iranians as demons. They have their logic. I'm, I will never say that they are uh, illogical. They are logical, according to their logic. They have logic that they are directed by Allah, and when Allah will decide that they should bomb somebody, they will do it. And this is the logic, and we have to understand it, and we have to, do, to, to see what we do with this. What can be done with this? I published this five years ago, and it's still valid. The world should tell the Iranians one thing. Very clear and very short. Something like, guys, our honored counterparts in Iran, you have one week, exactly one week, seven days, to load all your nuclear equipment on a ship or two or three and send it to us. In a week, we start to flatten you. Take us seriously, read our lips, and do what you should do. And don't call us, we will not call you. In a week from now, we start bombing you to flatten you with, with the earth. That time, the, 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 the Iranians will understand that the game is over. So far, they succeeded very cleverly to drag time, to buy time, to buy more time and more time, and every agreement which they signed with the, with the West was the basis for next negotiations, which ended in an agreement which was breach and basis for next negotiations and agreement and negotiations and agreements. This is how they dragged their feet for 16 years, which led to nowhere but to their program, which today is much more advanced as it was a year ago and two years ago. It doesn't help to assassinate here and there one uh, scientist or others because it became a common knowledge to a large community of scientists in Iran, it doesn't help to kill or to assassinate one of them, or two. Secondly, computer war or, or all these uh, Stokesnet and the other flames or all the other, uh, it might have some effect, but not real. The only thing which will change the direction is a credible threat. And you know, there is a big difference between a threat and a credible threat. A threat nobody believes. Credible threat, people start to believe you. And this is what should be given to the Iranians as one uh, uh, possibility. The other one is to support uh, all kinds of unrest in Iran with the Baluchis in the south or with the Kurds in the north or maybe both, with the Arabs in the south or others, the Azeris 
after all, Iran is a mosaic of ethnic groups, which can be dealt with by helping all kinds of groups to rebel against the central regime. This might also uh, bring an end to this Ayatollah uh, regime. And I'm more optimistic on the second, optim uh, second opportunity because uh, some 90% of the Iranians do not know how a mosque looks from within. Totally secular. Uh, I would even say many of them are against the religion, any religion, especially against the Ayatollahs. And uh, there, are ch there is good chance that with a help from outside, people in Iran will succeed to topple the regime by demonstrations, by riots, as we see all over the Arab world. Iran is not immune from that. And we, see, we saw it already in 2008, after the elections, where Ahmadinejad was re-elected, and uh, demonstrations were there, and later, uh, uh, the information came to the West that the Ayatollahs, the some leaders of Iran, already prepared an airplane to run away if those demonstrations uh, continue and their regime collapses. So it is a possibility. There is a way to do it. However, I'm not so sure that the world is resolute enough to push those minorities in order to topple the regime. And this is unfortunately why we see those Ayatollahs still in power. Nuclear Iran uh, might also pose danger to other parts of the world because they already have submarines and missiles which they know already how to launch those missiles from those submarines. They tested it and it works. The last component which they need is the nuclear weapon on these, on the, on these missiles in those submarines. If, if they succeed to merge these three components, the submarine, the missile, and the nuclear weapon, they can threaten the world from under the seas in front of Sydney, in front of Cape Town, in front of New York, Washington, and Liverpool as well. So this is why uh, nuclear Iran cannot be tolerated because those ayatollahs who are more than sure that Allah guides them and prevents them from any mistake, this kind of mindset equipped or armed with nuclear uh, uh, bomb is a danger to the stability of the world. I think that I will open the floor for the last 10 minutes. Oh, I still have 10 minutes to talk. Ah, good. Uh, there is another th something which should be noted in Iran. There is a sect inside Iran which has a strange belief. There's a splinter which came out from the Shia Islam. It is called the Hujatiya. Hujatiya is a small group headed by an ayatollah named Misbah Yazdi, alive today in Iran. They have a very strange uh, belief. They believe that the Mahdi, this uh, hidden im imam, the light, will return to the world in one of two uh, situations. The first is when all the people will become Shiites in the world, so he will come to reign the world since everybody believes in him. The other situation will be if the whole world sinks into a total mayhem. If all the rules, all the norms, all the boundaries in the world are breached and the world becomes a whole chaos, Allah will force this Mahdi to come back in order to rescue the world from this big mayhem. There is a Midrash in Judaism which says, En ben David ba ela bedor shekulo zakai o bedor shekulo chayav. Ben David means the Mashiach will come either in a generation which everybody is righteous or in a generation which everybody is sinful. Maybe this belief of the Hujatiya is some kind of replica of this Jewish uh, saying. 
They, those Hojatia people, believe that, there, that these uh, 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 possibilities, either to convert the world to Shizim or to push the world into a chaos, much easier to push the world to a chaos rather than converting the whole world to, is to Shi Islam. So their mission in life is to push the world to a mayhem. In the, in the first days of the revolution in 1979, Khomeini uh, almost outlawed them because he wanted to establish a state because Iran wants to be a state and to continue its, its plans. They don't want to push themselves to a chaos. They want to go inch by inch, step by step, state by state, to take the whole, whatever they can. They don't believe in mayhem. So he wanted to ban this group and to outlaw it. For some unknown reason, he did not. And they flourished, and they became wider and bigger. And today, they have the presidency, because Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is one of them. He believes in this worldwide mayhem. And his mentor, Misbah Yazdi, pushes him with others to this solution. Of course, Ahmadinejad has to find his way between those who don't believe in it. He is Mekarev Kitsin. He pushes the end of time too firmly. This is why others do not like him. But definitely, this sect, the Hujatia, is there, has influence on politics, and maybe might uh, uh, push Iran in the end of the day, in the end of the, the journey to a mayhem or to push the world into a mayhem. And this might explain some behaviors of the, of the Iranians. Uh, he himself, by the way, he had an epithet named Marde Hezare Gelule, means the man with thousand bullets. Because in his biography, which was published a few years ago, two years are missing between 1981 and 1982. Nothing is published about these two years in the life of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. What happened is that he was one of the court system of an ayatollah named uh, Khalkhali, who was the main executioner of the revolution. Every trial lasted for two minutes, which was only to verify the identity of the defendant. The next thing was to shoot him or to hang him. Ahmadinejad, his task was to shoot one shot into the head of every one who was hung up until he stopped moving. This was his role in the revolution. Some pictures which the Americans took when some youngsters uh, uh, took the American embassy, he is also in those pictures. Definitely somebody who would be uh, depicted as bandit, definitely, who became the president of this uh, state. However, as bandit as he is, and uh, some would say crazy, I'm not saying crazy, they have very, very firm logic. The threat, the only th credible threat can work. And we have a very good proof. If you remember, they took the American embassy uh, right after the revolution, and they caught those diplomats for 444 days, like a year and a half. Diplomats being caught, you, you can do it, they can. And they held those diplomats for 444 days in the days of Jimmy Carter, only because they saw that he does nothing to them. Those 50 something diplomats were released in the same very day that Ronald Reagan was sworn in office. Why? He told them, guys, if you don't send those guys back to us, 
I'm flattening Tehran. And they took him seriously. They took him seriously. Because he apparently made them believe him. That the first thing which he does as a president, after he uh, swears uh, allegiance to the state and to the constitution, he will flatten Tehran. So they believed him, so they released the boys. So this is why I do believe that a credible threat will change Iran as well today. Um, there are, and there are other cases where they were, by the way, another one is between 2003 and 6, they stopped develop, developing their nuclear uh, program. Again, because they saw what happened with Saddam in 2003, and they were afraid that they are the next online. So they stopped it. After some three years, when they saw that Americans are sinking in the Iraqi swamp, they understood that the, the Americans will do nothing, and they continue with the program as we see today. Three years, they were afraid. This is why they didn't continue. So this is why I'm saying that they want to survive as a state. They want to survive as a revolution. They want to survive as a Shi'i regime uh, led by Ayatollahs who think that they are uh, 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 prophets. They are not suicidal and they have very, very solid logic. This is why this logic has to be addressed with a logic, with their logic of credible threat. This is the only thing which can change them and let's hope that the world wakes up and start reading the right things about what researchers Right, and not myself, not only myself, write about Iran and the way how to address this problem of nuclear uh, Iran. Unfortunately, the West today is sleepwalking, in my view, vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, this problem, hopes that something will happen. Either Israel will do the job, or Allah will do the job, or maybe they will collapse, I don't know. But I am afraid that the world will wake up one morning to find that the rules of the game, of the political game in the world, are profoundly changed because Iran became a nuclear power. Sorry. The media narrative basically is being presented as everything that you didn't say. And it seems to me that's why people um, are not so aware of the real issue. And how is one going to go about changing the media narrative, what is presented not only in Al Jazeera, but on BBC and CNN that are not presenting the problem in the way you are, which is consequently um, making people's minds up as in this sort of fantasy that it's going to sort itself out. And second of all, very quickly, the Jewish community of Iran, is it going to be a very big decision? Um, are they going to affect the decision, whether it's by Israel or the rest of the world? Are they going to be held as, um, how do you call it, captives? Um, Pro Hostage, hostages. 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 They're going to be held as hostages. In other words, is, is, is that going to be a big part in the play of decision that uh, countries may make in the future with that issue? Well, about the media, one of the, thing which, one of the things which I'm not charge of, in charge of is what the media says about Iran. Whenever, I'm, when I, whenever I appear in the media, I say these things, which to some might sound not politically correct. This might be the reason why the media doesn't like to hear the reality about the Middle East, in other cases as well, like tribalism in the Middle East, which is still not only alive in kicking, it is alive in killing. But uh, who cares? Who wants to hear about this? Who wants to know about this? Everybody wants to see people who love peace and love, uh, to, uh, want to hug and kiss each other. Okay, the Middle East is not there, but people do not like to hear about this. So. Uh, this is what I am afraid of, that, that, that Iran, look, uh, uh, what media outlet will let somebody like myself stand like for 30 minutes to show what Iran is? I'm, I'm not so sure that uh, there is any TV station, maybe some academic TV, or who watches it, uh, like mainstream uh, um, news media uh, outlet doesn't have half an hour to hear a lecture about uh, something which they don't know about. Okay, so this is the problem. The media has to sell uh, cell phones. 
advertisements, okay? So this doesn't bring a rating. So this might answer, at least partially, the question about the media. Second, about the Jews in Iran. There are some 20,000 Jews in Iran. Uh, many ran away after the revolution, but like 20,000 uh, uh, remained. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, mainly assets, which they cannot sell or they cannot take out the money, so they remain, hoping that if something dreadful happens, they will be able to run out, to, to run away from, uh, from Iran. Uh, by the way, the Iranians allocate a seat in the parliament uh, for the Jews, another one for the Christians, by the way. So uh, there is some kind of image of um, normal life for Jews in Iran, and uh, they feel that they can uh, work and do whatever they like. Uh, when this volcano will uh, burn them all, I don't know, but uh, definitely they feel that they, they are comfortable. Otherwise, they wouldn't stay. Um, I want to know if you've ever obviously spoken to any high-level American, you know, the president or obviously any of the... Myself? Yes. I had a presentation in the American Congress a year and a half ago. Uh, it was planned for an hour. After three hours, I lost my voice. They learned a lot. Those, I actually uh, gave the lecture to staffers, which are more important in this case than the congressmen themselves. So, uh, yes, they asked many questions, and I tried to answer. Uh, to say that the American policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and Iran was dramatically changed, I'm not so sure. However, uh, there is somebody who comes to them very frequently and tries to change their mind. This, the, uh, this is the, the Saudi ambassador to, the, to, to Washington. Do you have no idea how much the Saudis are afraid from the Iranians? way much more than the Israelis. Because the Israelis, according to the rumors, have some kind of deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. The Saudis have nothing. Saudis are much closer to the Iranians, and the, uh, and the oil uh, fields and pipes and facilities of the Saudis are under the nose of the Iranians. And the Iranians already occupied some, some uh, islands in the Persian Gulf, and these islands actually threatened the Emirates and Saudi Arabia together. This, when you see the name Abu Dhabi in the sea, there are three islands, Tun the big, Tun the small, and Abu Musa. They uh, occupy those, uh, uh, those islands and they can launch any attack on the Emirates and Saudi Arabia from these islands. Only recently, Ahmadinejad visited those islands and, and the Saudi Arabia and the Emirates condemned it vociferously because they see this visit as a kind of preparation to a future attack on Saudi Arabia. And America doesn't want to listen to the, to the Saudi fears from Iran, which has way much more than the Israeli uh, uh, fears from Iran. So uh, this is why, by the way, the cold uh, atmosphere today between the American administration and Saudi Arabia, if you know. So definitely Saudi Arabia is shivers, shivering from fear from the Iranians, and yet the Americans are doing nothing against it. Isn't part of the problem um, of the West that uh, Russia and China are helping uh, Iran? Definitely. Because any decision by the Security Council, which might have been doing anything about the nuclear program, was blocked by Russia and China. Uh, China, because China is addicted to Iranian uh, oil and gas, and Russia is afraid for something else. And here, the globalization. Why Russia supports uh, Iran? Of course, there, are, there is very much commercial exchange between Russia and Iran. Uh, the Russians built the, the nuclear um, uh, electricity uh, reactor in Isfahan. And, but uh, but uh, Russia today is afraid of something else. What Russia is afraid of is very strange. 
if something happen in the, happens in the Gulf and the oil prices uh, climb sharply, the Chinese economy, which already today is a shaking economy, uh, will be even worse. Unemployment in China is poured to Russia because unemployed Chinese move to Russia to work in Siberia. Millions of Chinese already are in the central parts of Russia. Russia is afraid that any shake in the oil prices which might be in the Gulf because of problems with Iran will cause a problem, economic problem in China which will cause more millions, millions or more of Chinese to come to Russia. This is why Russia supports Iran, inter alia. Without meaning to oversimplify the matter, but we remember during the Cold War between a, a USA and the USSR, the concept of mutually assured destruction to some extent inhibited either country from, or it was a threat, a threat that it, the other country was aware that any launch would be retaliated straight away and they would be destroyed. You mentioned that the Ayatollahs, etc., are logical. Sure, they get their instructions from Allah, but nevertheless, they would be aware that any a nuclear attack against any country that's thought to have nuclear weapons would assure their own destruction. What do you think of that? There are attempts to draw lines between the experience of the world in the Cold War and what might be when Iran becomes nuclear. I cannot refute those attempts because I don't have yet the evidence that the Iranian case does not resemble some things which happened 20 or 30 years ago because it didn't happen yet. However, I must say that trying to understand the future only by taking the past and saying what will happen is exactly what happened, this is a very big mistake, especially when it comes to different cultures, when it comes to Iranian, which is totally different culture than the Russian, and of course the American one. So uh, with all the willing to draw conclusions from the Cold War between the United States and Russia on, and Soviet Union of those days, I still have doubts whether any conclusion of those days can be implied, can be implemented on different cultures, different times and different abilities. I wouldn't risk the world's security only because there is a theory which might have worked 30 years ago. Look, you know that every Friday, the Ayatollah Khamenei has his Friday sermon. Do you know where he delivers the sermon? Not in a mosque, in the university. Some would say, of course, the university is big, the mosque is small. That's not the reason. The mosque is empty, so the TV wouldn't like to show empty scene. They would rather show a full hall with students, young students, as if the young are following the revolution. And uh, of course, those students have to come on Friday, has to show up on Friday in the university. And the gates are closed, are, are locked until after the sermon. So they have to participate. Somebody is there to tell them when to applaud. And uh, the TV brings this full, full uh, hall, uh, hall full of students, uh, applaud to the Khamenei. But okay, those who look from outside think that the youngsters support the, 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 the Rahbar, the, the, the leader. Uh, those who know what happens behind the scenes know the, the reality. Look who, who was in the demonstrations after 2008 in the, in the, in the, in the, in the elections, after the elections were forged. Definitely all those youngsters who have nothing to do with the revolution, who wants freedom, who wants human rights and, and the women's rights and all those rights which they are denied. So this is why, I, according to many people who live in Iran and live out of Iran, the ratio of support to the regime is around 10% 
although people, of course, they would like to be powerful, but yet the regime of the Ayatollahs, very few want to see them. Thank you very much, and let's hope that the next in Daba, we will talk about the, about the uh, Ayatollah regime in Khabarkana, means as past. Thank you very much. <laughs>